Now let's talk about the last big technology um, sort of event or, 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 or big uh, wave that is happening now and that is really platform business models. Everyone wants to be a platform. Everyone dreams of being that clearinghouse. So let's discuss a little bit of what platform business models really mean. What is their competitive positioning, right? You can read, I mean, there are always these uh, in, in the magazines, they always uh, compare General Motors to Uber and Airbnb to Marriott. And they say, well, these platform models, they have no assets. They have nothing much, but look at their market valuation is as big as their big legacy or old economy type mm. of competitors. So let's explore this a little bit. There are, of course, many, many types of platform business models, as you can see. So it starts with a very simple one like search, like Google, right? Communications here like WhatsApp or Skype or WeChat. Uh, then there's, of course, social media like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. There's matching platforms like, like Tinder, TaskRabbit, eHarmony, right? There are content and review platforms like YouTube. Uh, there are uh, booking aggregators like Booking.com, uh, Expedia, Pagoda. There are retail platforms, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, um, yeah, Alibaba, I guess. And then there are payment platforms, Alipay, PayPal, Visa, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and of course, development platforms. So they're all platforms. They all are somehow at the center of a business ecosystem, right? And if you look at financial markets, these high valuations were given, why? Because they thought platforms have immense network effects that almost isolates them from competition. Yeah, so they're so big. Facebook is so big and nobody can compete with Facebook. Why? Because they have over a billion uh, users every day. And that gives them all that reach they need for their advertising, right? But if you look closer, that number one, there are different types of network effects. The first is called primary network effects. And this is what people always focused on. Primary network effect means a service becomes more valuable to me the more people are on this network. So it means if I'm the only guy on Facebook or on a social media platform, it's pretty useless, right? <laughs> but the minute my wife and my kids are on the same platform, already is more useful because I can communicate with more people, right? And of course, the bigger it becomes, I mean, on, on, for example, I use LinkedIn a lot. I can almost find everyone on LinkedIn and yeah, and I can search my contacts and everything. So there's a ton of value for me. And this is what they call primary network effect. But you think about, let's say for Google, for search uh, platform, actually there is no primary network effect. Because what I want is what? Search result. So if you give me a new search engine that is better than Google, why don't I switch? I can, right? It's very easy. There's no network effect here. And in fact, there's a startup in Singapore that actually, they're quite funny. What they do is great, uh, a great um, search engine. But what they say is, look, Every user on Google generates about 110, 120 US dollars advertising revenue for Google. So by you using Google, Google earns 100 over US dollars advertising revenue on you per annum. So what this new web website did, they, uh, the new search engine did, they say, I share this revenue with you. So you use me and I pay you half of whatever advertising revenue you generate through your searches and what you do and through your clicks and so on, right? So I mean, there's no primary network. If somebody else comes in with a better solution, a better value proposition, Google is out. Because of course they can also evolve, but it's not like Facebook. Facebook is a lot harder to dislodge because even if I develop a better Facebook, 
unless I get everyone on my platform, is, is, is useless. So this is the, the primary network effects. They're really only in communications, why I need to talk to everyone. They're really only in social media because I need to, uh, I want to connect to everyone. But let's say for sharing economy, that's sort of the big topic, right? Sharing economy, Didi, Airbnb, uh, Uber, Lyft, these are all sharing economy platforms and they have billions of dollars of valuations and the idea is network effects but again they are not primary network effects we are talking about now something we call secondary network effects and I'll give you an example if I'm a customer on Uber or Didi so for example sometimes I take a, a, one of these co companies to work so if you have a party at night I don't want to drive right so I take a I, I take a here in Singapore a, a, um, a grab taxi or, or one of a grab uh, car and uh, so I chatted with the driver it was quite interesting he only does two trips a day he goes from home to work and from work to home and on either trip, he always matches to one passenger. So he only makes two pay trips a day and supplements his income. And he says these two trips almost pay for his car. So what he has to offer on this platform is a trip which is close to my home, his home, right? And then close to where I work, where he, he works at Science Park, which is next door to the university. That's his product. So how many customers do he, does he need? He actually only needs one, right? He only needs to find one guy or one lady here who has the similar trip in the morning, meaning same pickup location or similar pickup location, similar drop off location at same time. And the same for the reverse trip. So the minute a network is big enough that this matching quality, we call this matching quality. So this is on three attributes, right? Pick up, drop off, and time. Oh, these three variables here. If I can find one other customer here who fits that capacity and that offer, the matching quality is good enough, meaning having then more customers or more drivers on the platform at zero value. So we call this critical mass. So this platform, you only have a protection of these net secondary network effects as long as competitors have not reached this critical mass. And this critical mass is a lot lower than people think and you can buy it. So the, I mean, we wrote in my textbook, I wrote this case study Diddy against Uber and already be when Uber was still in China, we predicted they had a hard time, not because Diddy got sort of regulatory help and so on, but much more that Uber innovated too slowly. Diddy was a lot more innovative in China. Yes, it did a lot more things for the Chinese market Uber didn't do. Yeah. And again, Uber lost in China. They also lost in Southeast Asia, so they folded up and sold everything to Grab. And the minute Uber was gone, a new company entered in Singapore. So if you believe in network effects, why does a new company enter? Yes. So it's, if you have enough money to, to fund the initial growth, to build the initial network size, you can compete. And what we have seen in America and many other markets, even in Singapore here is, if in America, we call this multi-homing, meaning driver and passenger, they both have multiple services on their phones. So in America, a driver can work for Uber and for Lyft. So the driver takes which company? Whichever has the better trip and the better margin, right? So I, as a driver, I take the better trip the better, more profitable trip. As a customer, they also do multi-homing. They have Uber and Lyft on their handphone. They look at both. One has search pricing, the other doesn't. So what, who does the customer? One has a car right away, the other doesn't have a car right away. So again, the customer picks the more convenient car at the lower price, and the driver picks the more convenient customer at the higher price. So what gets squeezed in between is the margin of the platform. So if you think there's no competition in platforms, it is not true. Multi-homing, 
means direct price competition very, very quickly. So that's, I think this is to, to keep in mind here when you think platform is, is sort of the key way to sidestep competition, it is a much less um, safe a competitive position than most companies think. So if you ask me, even for platforms, customer user experience, onboarding, booking processes, payment processes, conflict resolution, all of these services topics are really that differentiate a platform and that make customers loyal to a platform is not so much the network effects. Now, of course, a platform has not only two sides. We can talk about platform ecosystems. So there are many players, right? You have the platform, you have the provider like the driver, you have the customer like the rider here, but then there are also complementers. So a platform can contain many, many players. If you're Airbnb, it may include restaurants, tour guides, uh, local transport, there may be any, many other translators, yes? so there are many other uh, services that can be part, on, part of that ecosystem and platform. And the more you have, the more sticky the platform becomes, the harder it is to copy the, the platform. And then of course, you have many adjacent uh, uh, people and, and players to worry about, like policy, society, incumbent, other actors and their competitors, and you're never you are never playing in an isolated field. The, my thinking was, if you look at uh, companies like Marriott, companies like taxi companies, they were stunned and surprised when platforms happened. But guess what? They all recovered. <laughs> in Singapore, if you are a customer, the taxi app and the ride-sharing apps, they're equally convenient. I can see on the taxi where the taxi is, I can call the driver, I can pay via whatever payment mechanism. So from a customer angle now, between the taxi company and between uh, Grab or any of these other providers, there's no difference from the journey perspective. Actually, for me, I now for any important trip, I switch back to the taxi company. Why? They don't cancel on me. They say they're here at 8 o'clock, they're here at 8 o'clock. Yeah, they're more reliable, yes? So you can see they're, 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 the, the difference there is becoming less. So what you, what you will see is, initially all the big legacy companies were very surprised, but now the, at least the customer interface and the platform part, they integrate this into their own business models. And you can see here, we, we look at platforms, there are is there something physical involved? So is it, is it something you sell something or you just get an experience? So I buy something on Amazon, there's a delivery of a good. But I take a ride, there's no selling of anything. Right? You deliver a performance, you deliver a service. Then the other big difference on this platform, is that service or asset peer provided or is it platform provided? It's a big difference. Let's say Didi, Uber, Airbnb, the assets are peer provided. Meaning a, a driver logs onto the website, a, somebody who has a flat or a room logs onto the website and lists it's there. That means Airbnb doesn't have to do any rental, doesn't have to get any hotel rooms or nothing. So scaling growth is very, very fast. Right? On the other hand, if it's a platform where the assets are owned or controlled by the provider, like WeWork, like Zipcar, that means they have the assets, they have the risk, um, they have the control, and the only difference between legacy providers, let's say you have Zipcar and you have Avis or Hertz. So what's the difference between Hertz and Zipcar? The only difference was Hertz, I have to go to a particular station, pick up the car, I have to rent it for at least a day, and I have to drop it off again at a certain location. Right? Zip car, the difference is this car is parked anywhere in the city. I can look on my phone, where is the next available car? I can reserve the car, I use it for 20 minutes, and I drop it anywhere again, I'm charged by the minute. But the car is still owned by Zipcar. 
or controlled by Zipcar, right? So the difference was much more in terms of the flexibility and the inter uh, interaction on the app. So they have the car rental, the more traditional bit, and they have the Zipcar here. Okay, so you can see the peer provided, marketer provided. So what's happening here now is we have all of the legacy companies moving into platforms. Accor is the world's largest hotel company outside the US. They launched One Fine Stay as a peer provided uh, uh, platform of high end um, uh, uh, shared accommodation. Yeah. Marriott is going into platforms. So they're all, and, and the nice thing is they all put this in part of their booking engines, their websites. Uh, the advantage they have is that, say, if I collect points on business travel in Marriott or in, Air, uh, in Accor, I can use these loyalty points to redeem a platform sharing house, for example. Whereas on Airbnb, I don't have that, right? I don't collect points on business. So you can see the legacy providers here have actually nice competitive advantage in certain areas moving into platforms. Why? They have distribution, they have brands, they have loyalty programs, they have boots on the ground. So if I want to put certain capacity into a city, I already have people working there. Right? So I, I can offer sort of a mix between uh, running a hotel and running a shared facility and then even adding peer provided services. Right? Also, Uber, Airbnb, they go into here like Uber, everyone is speculating when will autonomous cars be good enough so that I can offer taxi services without drivers. The minute that is possible, so Uber is already experimenting with it. I'm sure Diddy is experimenting with it. The minute this is possible, Uber and Diddy and, and all these companies will own or control these cars and they're not peer provided anymore. Airbnb is the same thing. Airbnb moves into controlling uh, certain uh, uh, apartments now in New York and San Francisco. It's not peer provided anymore, it's Airbnb owned. And likewise, here, there's no reason why someone like we, we work, they're a bit in trouble now, but uh, and, and they will be badly in trouble now with the crisis, yeah? <laughs> but. There is no reason why WeWork can't use its platform and say, look, currently WeWork rents the offices. Why can't they allow a business that has spare office capacity to list it on their website? Right? They could go into this model. So what you can see is here, this whole space of platforms is really shifting and everyone moves into everyone else's space. And my prediction is that in three to five years, what you will have like a company like Marriott or like Airbnb will play simultaneously in all of these spaces. And the outcome will be that for capacity, you know you have a very high utilization, a very high load factor, a very high occupancy rate. You will control, control and own that capacity. Why? That is cheaper than using peer provided capacity. So if, I, if I'm in New York and I know I can rent out this room for 340 days a year, I own it. For peer provided, I will go for stuff that is sort of shoulder season and low season. Oktoberfest in Munich, every room is booked out. <laughs> so I will not build capacity for the Oktoberfest or for an exhibition or something. This will be peer provided. Uh, so this is, I think, where we will be going. So even for platforms, I hope you understand there is a lot more to the eye right now. I think valuations for platforms are completely overdone. So if I have a choice between buying Marriott stock versus Airbnb stock at current valuations, Marriott is the safer bet because they will be in platforms as Airbnb, Airbnb will be in hotels as well. You can see, so these are the, the different paths that are happening here. Good. So what I would like to do is, I mean, do you think for your own business, platforms will be important in the industry? Are there players 
that are developing platforms. And I know, for example, GE tried to develop platforms, Siemens is trying to develop platforms, but not too successfully because customers are afraid of being locked in, right? But there's so much value in having a platform for everyone. So is there something happening in your industry? So let's, let's discuss this in your, uh, in your group's briefing. So do you think platforms are not important, somewhat important, or can be very important in the next two to four years? So let's do the voting. So two minutes, and then we do the voting. Okay, and then we break here. And then, now, given the voting, what we have just discussed, do you think you should, in your industry or your business, also develop a platform? Is there something you want to do and can do? All right. Thanks for the great video. Okay, before we get Prof to, uh, to, to response to the questions that have been uh, inserted in the chat box, uh, maybe Prof Yoken, would you like to add some comments uh, on the video before the Q&A session? Yeah, um, Jason, no, I mean, thank you for using the video. Yeah. This was from my executive MBA class. And this was right after COVID hit last year. So we had to go from one day off, the, off, off, off to the next and go online. <clears throat> and I'm surprised how little changed since last year. You know, I mean, uh, platforms are moving so fast, but all of the topics we discussed there are um, equally still applicable. And, and many things we predicted, I mean, we did a paper on, on convergence of business models where platforms move into pipelines and pipelines move into platforms. This was a paper we published last year and it's happening. I mean, here in Singapore, just um, I think it was one or two weeks ago, the local taxi company Comfort, they are fighting, of course, very hard against Grab here. But what they started to do now is to uh, do the same that was what Grab does. They, in addition to their own taxi drivers, you can now sign up on their own platform and offer your services. So in a way, they have a base capacity with their own taxis, which they own and lease out to taxi drivers. And then they add peer-provided um, cars, which helps them, especially during peak periods, to provide the capacity which otherwise they, they could, could never deliver service when it rains here or a busy day. I mean, a, of course, during COVID things are a little easier, but still it's so busy again now that it is hard to get a taxi when it's uh, beginning of the day or end of the working day and it rains. And so a lot of these things which we develop conceptually, I can see now that they are coming in the market. Right. Thank, thank you, Prof. Yeah. So do you want to do, want we discuss the questions that were posted or how do you want to do this? We can actually start with the questions, uh, the one, okay. one posted, then we can move on to the list of questions that I have from my side. Okay, okay. So yeah, I mean, let so me start excited the one with the shift. <laughs> yeah, let yeah. me start the one with the shifting of ownership. I mean, this is a decision you make, right? You can... I mean, I wouldn't say ownership is what matters. It matters control. I mean, WeWorks doesn't own any office space, but they have long-term rentals, so they control it. And if the capacity is not used, they still have to pay their rental. So in that sense, they carry the risk of these assets. And Airbnb doesn't have the risk of assets because they are owned and controlled by peers. So the peers, they may own their flats or they may rent their flats, but then they sublet pieces of that on Airbnb. So there are two different business models here. And long-term, what we predict is that, which is also happening, if I'm Airbnb and I know that um, I can rent out rooms in New York 360 days a year, I make a lot more money if I either own these assets or sign long-term rental of these assets and then put them onto Airbnb to lease them out compared to if I buy these assets or these rooms from uh, P 
peer providers in the market because then I only get a commission and the whole revenue goes to the peer provider. Whereas if I control it and own it, the entire revenue goes to me. So it's much more profitable to own it if the capacity utilization is very high, right? Uh, if you think ahead in five years, Grab, Uber, they, if, if uh, there are autonomous cars, so currently the, the peers provide labor and the car, but in future, it will just be the car. I mean, uh, it would be much cheaper for me as Uber to actually buy or lease those cars, take the risk on those cars and put them out onto the street for the base load. Meaning the cars that are operational 75, 80% of the day, I, I control them, I own them, I take the full revenue. Only for the peaks, morning peak, evening peak, I then say, look, I don't want to own a car just for two hours of driving a day. So then I invite peer providers to come in to do this. So I think this, this mix of control versus um, for base load and then having peer provided peak capacity, this is where most industries will go to. Yes. And now, whether you're starting as an Airbnb and you're adding controlled capacity or you're starting as uh, a car or Marriott and you're adding peer provided capacity in the end, in five to 10 years, we all end up in about the same place. Very interesting. Feel free to, to, to <laughs> jump in here, right? Um, the ownership, I think there was a question about the yeah. scroll up. You're right, Prof. Now the pri the privacy bit. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, we are just. I mean, I was just working on a paper on corporate digital responsibility, and it's not just privacy. I mean, privacy. We have done tons of research for decades now. Um, the interesting thing is now what's happening is you you. Um, on the data side, new technologies allow an unbelievable amount of surveillance and data and observation. I mean, if you take the data from your phone, the data from your car, uh, data from your Fitbit, uh, data from your Facebook, I add to this biometrics. I mean, I did some work with NEC, they're, they're a world leader in biometrics. They run all the immigration here in Singapore for biometrics and the police and, and all of this. I can, I can do retina reading while you walk, I can identify you, right? So the amount of, of, of data I can collect about you is just mind boggling. But conceptually, nothing has changed because the data privacy and all of this has been around for a long time. <clears throat> it is just that it has become so much more pressing simply because of the technology, um, uh, ability of technology, but the, Interesting new angle is not just data, but now we are talking about intelligent automation, about AI, about algorithms, but about autonomous uh, service delivery and services and, and so on. And there's all of this, this concern. So I have elderly care robots. Does it dehumanize elderly people who are now being, so now the son doesn't feel he has to go anymore and visit grandma so often, right? Because there's a cute robot taking care of grandma, <laughs> you know? Uh, we have um, autonomous, I mean, all the algorithm, right? Uh, the, the algorithms um, base decisions on variables. So these variables are created. So I can, depending on the country, I can actually harvest data from your LinkedIn, from your Twitter, from your, Facebook, which is public information. And I can see, do I see you there party a lot? Do I see you smoke on pictures? Do I see you having tattoos? Do I see you in a fast car, right? I can, uh, yeah, do I see you doing bungee jumping or God knows what, or diving? So based on this, I can sort of build a variable called, let's say, how risky is your lifestyle? Or how healthy is your lifestyle? And based on this, I can, for example, make decisions whether I give you health insurance, whether I give you life insurance, and at what rate I give you life insurance. So there are many issues with this because number one, these data may not be reliable as you're assessing riskiness, but maybe I'm very boastful on my Facebook and in reality, all I do is sit and write textbooks, right? <laughs> so, 
so I mean, the, the variable is not reliable, and, and then you make decisions based on it. And then many decisions are also considered not fair or ethical. I mean, in the US, the basic examples where you address if somebody, if you live somewhere and the person next to you becomes a bankrupt, your zip code becomes a high risk zip code, and, and you have a harder time getting loans. Yeah. So I think the privacy and uh, corporate digital responsibility are very hot issues. And I look at this at the whole life cycle of both technology and data, and it's the capturing and the creation of data and technology. So how, how ethical is it for, and how fair and how private is it what I do with how I capture the data from you and then how I create and develop the technology. The next is the operation. So I, based on whatever I have, I create variables, I, I make, make decisions, I, I serve you. So there are tons of issues in, in how this happens. The next one is uh, these technologies are malleable, meaning they can be used for other purposes than for what they were intended. Um, there may be side effects of this. Let's say so many things in social media. I mean, the, all the algorithms were built to, to get engagement. And then you get some of these echo chambers and fake news and all of this, which was a side effect of, of what they did to get more engagement or that the extreme views are pushed so much. So do we review those um, unintended consequences? So this is the whole refinement is the third stage. And the final stage is, of course, uh, safekeeping and, and retirement of data. Uh, do I, have, I mean, in Europe, you have the right of, um, of being forgotten. So you can't keep data forever if somebody, but somebody has to, in Europe, still make a case for that. I want these data removed. But maybe it should be only be fair that data get, get retired after some time. And even there, even if not fully retired, if I have a decision algorithm, how heavily do I weigh the most recent data versus old data, right? I mean, my old data may show I'm a very risky person or now I'm much older, so I'm a much safer person. So should the old data still be considered in, in a decision, right? So there, there's a huge, huge, huge area and we have not really seen a lot of research on corporate digital responsibility and privacy and all of that stuff that relates to algorithms, algorithm decision-making serving by customers and uh, serving robots, uh, serving customers through robots and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think quality, uh, come on, you, you can, you can do everything in terms of quality on a platform. Mm -hmm. It depends how tight is your governance. You look at one fine stay only has luxury accommodation. So if I'm more high end, then I have a much tighter vetting of providers. I take feedback much more seriously. I kick out rouge providers or providers who don't deliver the quality. I can do badging like what Airbnb does, and you're a super host. So I, I can, I can, there, there's enough there what tools I can use to drive quality. That's fine. Wow, that's interesting, bro. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that has really developed. I mean, I don't have to own anymore. I mean, if you think about it, even Airbnb, mm -hmm. um, so even Marriott and even Accor, they don't own already most of their properties. They're owned by individual property holding companies, right? And still they manage quality. You know? Although they don't have, they only usually give you the general manager, but not even the staff is employed by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, Prof, for the input, yeah. Prof. Okay, Prof, uh, maybe uh, we will go to the first question that we compile. All right, this question came from Miss Maya Bella Fresnido from Philippines. Okay, hello. Uh, uh, I'm not sure why it's echo. <laughs> uh, hello, testing? Yes. Uh, okay, so Prof, the question sounds something like this. Uh, since everyone on this planet is a potential end user of these platforms, how can a company effectively narrow the gap between countries with differing levels of technology? especially if the company plans to sell its product and services globally? Yeah, so what, I mean, good, good, good question. I mean, think about it. You, you think that a lot of these services are indefinite, indefinitely scalable and across countries. But if you look like, so, I mean, I always use Uber. We wrote a case study on Uber against Didi in China where Uber lost. So Uber was sort of the predominant, biggest, best funded, most advanced, um, uh, uh, sort of ride-sharing platform in the world, and they wanted to conquer the world. 
And I mean, uh, it, it, China was the first market they got a bloody nose simply because they were too slow. They did not innovate fast enough. Chinese at that time didn't have credit cards. They use Alipay and other tools. So Uber didn't have that, Didi had that. So it took them some time to, to put it in. Um, Chinese drivers didn't have the money to buy cars like in the US. So Didi provided loans for drivers to buy their cars. And so you can see there were a lot of those things where Didi just was two steps ahead of Uber in implementing this. And then Uber in the end, um, surrendered simply because they lost too much money. They lost 1.5 billion US dollars in, in the last year before they sold out to Didi. And the story in Southeast Asia with Grab is similar, right? I mean, a uh, uh, lot of issues locally here that Uber didn't quite address. Grab was faster. And at the moment, if you look at uh, Uber, they're losing against Ola in, in India. So I think if you want to be a global player, you have to make sure what you have is adapted to local countries. So diff I mean, I remember Indonesia, I, I'm not too sure that's still the case, but forever Indonesia was the largest user of BlackBerry, even when BlackBerry was hardly in business anymore. But if you wanted to be in e-commerce, you had to be on BlackBerry in Indonesia. So if your app doesn't work on BlackBerry, you can't enter that market, right? <laughs> At least at that time. So I mean, you may. Th these are often very small things, but you have to go into the country to see what is it you have to adapt here to make it um, doable. And I mean, this is something that's not not new in marketing, right? Every company. I mean, yeah, uh, um, you, you are a global company, but you act local, right? So you you do have the overarching technology business model and all of this, but then you still have to adapt it to, to local technology, customer usage, payment platforms, and, and what else, regulatory frameworks, whatever else is, is locally there. And I mean, we have seen now that it is possible to beat large US platform players. There, there is a, if, if the local market is different enough, you can enter. At the same time, I mean, for example, I'm still on Uber simply for the simple reason, if I travel to Europe and so on and enter the US, I, it is great to be anywhere in the world to use it. So it's a different value proposition, right? So I, I use Uber for, for countries where I travel and, and uh, rather than using local, local taxi companies or local apps. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Bob. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Yeah, it's... yeah. <laughs> All right, Prof. We will have another question from Anna Agong Satya Utama from Indonesia. Uh, I think I think this question has already been addressed earlier about the issues of ethics and security. So maybe we move on to the next questions uh, by Stan Kahot Joe from Thailand as well as Sue from Malaysia. So the questions basically are combined. All right, it sounds like this, Prof. As far as we know, the platform business model is using technology to interact with customers and, and to create business opportunities. However, we cannot deny the impact of cross-cultural differences in the consumption experience among the customers. There are two questions basically, Prof. The first question would be, how is the platform business model deals with the market with different cultures effectively? Number two is, what can the platform do to enhance the transparency aspect of it uh, simply because if we, we look at the context of Airbnb, the scenario is quite true whereby the Airbnb in the Westerns, uh, if compared to the Southeast Asia, the Westerns look more genuine and trustable compared to what we have in the Asian context. So it's Sorry, Jason. Yeah. Yes, Prof? Okay, okay. Can, can you just repeat the last sentence? So you were a bit intermittent. I don't know why my internet seems to be dying here. I don't know. <laughs> so no worries. This, uh, this one, we have two questions, basically. I will start with the first one first. All right. How this platform business model deals with the market with different culture effectively? Yeah. Okay. I know this question I got, that was the first part of it, right? I mean, this is no different from all the other stuff we do in marketing, right? You go, you're... You have a core value proposition and you have to see does that fit to the market let's say um 
let's say labor cost savings, for example, are not such a hot value proposition in countries like Vietnam or India, but they're a huge value proposition in countries like US or Europe or Singapore. So it's, it's I mean, is the basic value proposition you have attractive or is it different, right? So for me, for example, when, when I, 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 now I don't travel, but before I traveled to Vietnam, um, it's always a major uh, struggle for me to agree on the price with taxi drivers, <laughs> you know? And I don't know where they're taking me. <laughs> so, so with an app, I know exactly what it costs. I know where the taxi is. I know the route it should be taking, right? So the value proposition shifted from being cheaper to being safer and more convenient. Uh, it takes away the language barrier. So I think you have to look at, at carefully what's the value proposition you have for every country. Like in Singapore, cars are so expensive, labor relatively not in, in comparison, let's say, to the US. So here the value proposition or what the, the advantages of someone like Grab is they use their car 90% of the day. And that's the most expensive asset here. Yes, whereas in the US, the car is very cheap. So there the, the proposition is much more um, you're, you're cutting labor costs in, in a way, in a bit on car. But you can see in every market, you have to look at, okay, what's the core value proposition here? How does it fit? Uh, that's the basic business model. And I mean, as I said, that could be asset price, that could be labor cost, uh, that could be also things like authenticity, right? People like to travel somewhere and have a local dining experience, a local stay experience and so on. So I think every one of these platforms has a slightly different um, value proposition. And you can already think you look at a US market, you look at a Japanese market, you look at Thai market, you look at a Chinese market or an Indian market, you can see how attractive is that value proposition in that market. So I think it, it really goes down to the basic business model first, and then only do you look, okay, do I need language? Do I, what languages do I need? What payment mechanisms do I need? Yeah, what's the customer journey I need? So the, the, say the, e, the mobile e-commerce e um, infrastructure, for example, in China is so very different from the US. So between those countries, it's very hard to have something that cuts across both ecosystems. But let's say between Singapore, US, I think most things work. And I think in Southeast Asia too, the basic infrastructure works in most countries. All right, thank you, Prof. Okay, yeah. maybe we can take another one or two questions. All right, so I will read out the next question, Prof. Okay, from Dr. Aaron Tam from Australia. So uh, Dr. Aaron Tam is, under, uh, is asking whether um, this, this is the questions. I wonder that if, uh, for example, I read it out the questions. Uh, hi, Jochen, many thanks for the insights to the needs of the successful platform orders. I wonder that if such disruptions will occur in the industry that have high entry barriers, for example, higher education, medical, airline industry can work given the level of regulations or rate within such industry. Yeah. I mean, Coursera is a platform, right? Peer provided content distributed to many people. So they do have a platform, like Coursera, Khan Academy. There are many examples of platforms. And, and I mean, the question again is value proposition. So Coursera, for example, NUS, we are, we are giving certificates on Coursera. So there's the certificate from the university, there's the platform by the platform provider. And I mean, uh, publishers like Pearson, this is sort of my publisher, uh, publishers like Harvard Business School Publishing, they are working hard to becoming a platform. I mean, uh, Harvard Business School Publishing, for example, for our MBA and so on courses, many of the very skill-based stuff, such, such as the basic mathematics for business, statistics, basic accounting, and all of this stuff, we don't teach that anymore. We buy a online um, module from Harvard Business School Publishing or, or McGraw-Hill or Pearson. It's a platform where we that's white labeled. So we put our NUS logo on it. We put the name of our professor on it. And the professor ticks which modules 
um, he or she wants to have for, for this. And it's, it's a complete technology, it's a complete platform. I can see exactly for every student, did that student, <clears throat> how many minutes did the student spend with content, did, uh, watch this, the videos, did the student do all the tests at what success rate and, and, and how often the tests, how many contributions did the student make in discussion forums? And so it's complete visibility. Yeah? And um, that's a platform. Textbook publishers, let's say Pearson, rather than selling textbooks, they give you a license on a per student basis. And the whole uh, um, <clears throat> marketing management Kotler book is a license for 150 US dollars licensed to the school on a per student basis. To, to then deliver this course. <clears throat> Sorry. So there are many examples where there are many players trying to build these type of platforms. It's just unlike, let's say, Airbnb and so on there. It's, a, it's like a cowboy land at the moment. Everyone is grabbing share, uh, but there's no dominant mechanism or dominant player yet. But give it 10, 15 years, I think it will be like any other market that there may be either it's Harvard Business School Publishing or it's Coursera or it's Pearson Education or it's a particular university, right? Then for many angles can, can players enter that market. I mean, and that's the, at the moment, the exciting thing is not really sure that you know who will win, right? You can't tell at the moment. I think yeah, that's thank you. yeah. Thank you, Prof. So okay, we have one interesting questions came in from Dr. Mageswari from Malaysia. So yes. The question sounds like this, Prof. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed education forever. Teaching and learning, like what you say earlier, implementing various types of online platform, even though it assists much to sustain in the industry during the pandemic through the remote. On the other hand, students and educators are affected to with high digital timing exposures. What is the psychomatic effect of this, especially on younger learners? How service marketing could address this issue? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, this is a very interesting issue and you, you will have seen what um, automation and, and a lot of the technology did was de-skilled jobs. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you take an online broker or robot advisor versus the old personal financial banker. The personal financial banker earns a few hundred thousand dollars a year. The robot advisor doesn't cost anything. And the call center staff costs you $5 per call, right? So, it uh, and the skill level is a lot less. And I think that will happen in ev almost all industries that a lot of the simple kind of services will be automated and, and, and will be technology enhanced delivered, including stuff like simple general doctor and so on. Um, and I give an example. I mean, you in education, you don't need a research, thousands of research universities around the world. But my guess is that in 20 or 30 years, you, you may have 50, 30 world class research universities left, and everyone else will be much more of a much lower cost teaching type of university. And even there, it will be a lot more technology enhanced. So will, will especially younger kids and, and younger students need personal touch? Absolutely. But do they need an ex the touch of an expensive professor? Maybe not, right? <laughs> so, so maybe you can take a lower skilled people who take pre-cooked courseware. And I mean, say, for example, already many schools use PhD students to teach undergraduates. Yeah? Or you can use take MBA students to teach uh, entry-level undergraduates. So I think you will get a lot more of, of this where we have scalable courseware, scalable online experiences, scalable whatever in teaching. And then we still do the personal touch by having someone to handhold and guide you a person through this. And I mean, Scandinavia has been experimenting a lot with kindergartens. I mean, don't laugh, but they in the old days, they had a kindergarten auntie. Um, they're taking care of 15 kids. So three groups of five teach them simple stuff like writing and mathematics. And now they're playing with robots. So they have a table, a round big table with five kids on a table. And then this little robot sitting on top of the table. So the teacher teaches mathematics, but then the kids interact with their robots on the table, on, on the robot asks questions and they do stuff and so on. And the research is not bad. I mean, the, the, the kids like it uh, simply because why? 
the robot never gets angry. <laughs> you know, the robot asks, answers the same question for how often the kids want it. The kids can tease the robot and the robot sort of takes it and teases back. So this mix, which is actually a lot cheaper than pure people delivered, may actually work better in many contexts. For example, in the old days, uh, uh, I mean, Denmark, Sweden, they had maybe 10, eight kids for a class. But if you have a robot for every team, you can have 15 people for, for one, one, one staff. You know, so I think we, we at the beginning of this whole thing, we don't know where it will lead to. But uh, I think we can look forward to fantastic quality and productivity gains uh, thanks to this development. Yeah, thank you, Prof. So, Prof, maybe one final question. One final question. Uh, this just came to me through WhatsApp. Okay. This, uh, as we know that tourism and hospitality is badly affected due to this crisis of COVID-19. Uh, just wondering how would you predict the development of service marketing in industry which relies on automation more and more? Is that the way to ensure uh, sustainability for them? I mean, I'm sure you're all on LinkedIn and Facebook and so on. You will see all of these points that who drove the, the, the digital revolution, the digitization of the business, the CEO or COVID, right? <laughs> we all know it's COVID, yeah. I mean, look, my, my professor colleagues here at the schools, so I'm vice dean MBA programs, right? So, I mean, I had to push so hard for them to do anything online. And within COVID, and, and, and within weeks, everyone was online. Within weeks, we had our studio and so on. So it, it really pushed it. So I think COVID um, sort of is a catalyst here that allowed the in implementation of digital and remote uh, to happen much faster. I mean, just the fact that we have this conference here and we're all on Zoom and it's very natural to all of us. And I've been on many more conferences now since we have Zoom than before, because in the old days I had to travel everywhere, so I can't travel so much. So I turned down everyone. And now with this, we can meet more often and, and, and wider. It doesn't matter where you are. In my EMBA class in the old days, I brought everyone in. Um, they either talked before lunch or before dinner of the class, and then they joined for lunch or dinner. So it was always a personal story. Yeah. And, and now, hey, it doesn't matter. I, I, I take all the people I know from all, anywhere in the world, and they come into my class and on Zoom and they're on the big screen. And I mean, everyone likes it and enjoys it. So I think um, things are moving faster. So this whole idea, I mean, the book we just published on intelligent automation. So to me, I see there's an enormous um, opportunity for services marketing because uh, a lot of new challenges for us here and the stuff we know about customer journey design, um, governance, service recovery, um, feedback systems and all of this is equally applicable. It just works slightly differently in, in a digital environment, but it's, it's critically important. I mean, if you get don't get those things right, you're, you will fail with your services. So I, I think we just probably keep the same basic principles, but apply them in a digi digital world. Oh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Prof. Good, then thank you so much, everyone. I, I wish you a wonderful evening. Uh, yeah. It was an honor and pleasure to meet you all. And I'm so impressed that you do this every week and work so hard together and learn from each other. I think that's wonderful. Yeah.